The narrative begins with a woman sharing some of the history of her people on the desert planet Arrakis. Chani, the woman, is a freeman. She reveals that the planet has been governed by the ruthless Harkonnens since before she was born, who have become incredibly wealthy by harvesting the psychoactive substance known as melange or the spice. The freemen have been attempting in vain to drive out the Harkonnens. The Harkonnens, however, have recently been told to depart Arrakis by the Padisha Emperor Shaddam IV. Who will be the new rulers? asked Chani. Now we go back at homeworld of House Atreides. Paul Atreides has breakfast on the planet Caladan with his mother, Lady Jessica, the concubine of Duke Leto. Jessica has been attempting to impart to her son the unique abilities of her order, the Bene Gesserit, a quasi-religious group. She puts Paul to the test by having him attempt to force her to give him a drink of water. Paul's success is only sporadic. Later that day, Paul gains knowledge about the inhabitants and planet of Arrakis. It is the only place where the psychotropic spice that lengthens life and perception can be found. Spice is essential for interstellar travel because it enables the navigator's expanded consciousness, which they use to plan jumps faster than the speed of light and fold spacetime to go instantly from one planet to another. In the next event, Leto Atreides is visited by an imperial envoy who formalizes the awarding of Arrakis to House Atreides along with soldier Gurney Halleck and Mentat Thufir Hawat. The emperor is concerned about Leto's rising popularity and political influence in the Landsrod, a gathering of aristocratic households. Leto is aware that the imperial offer to supervise Arrakis is a type of trap, yet he cannot turn it down. When Duncan Idaho, an elite soldier, visits Arrakis weeks in advance to investigate the area, Paul begs him to join him. Duncan turns down. Paul admits to experiencing dreams about Arrakis and the Freeman, one of which features Duncan dying in battle. Paul is informed by Duncan that everything important happens when we're awake, and that this is only a dream. Paul tells his father that he wants to go to Arrakis early, but Leto declines, explaining that he needs Paul by his side. He describes the political situation, saying that to his advantage, the emperor has instigated a war between Houses Atreides and Harkonnen. Leto instead plans to form a partnership with the Freeman in order to use their desert power for his purposes and trick the emperor. Paul shares his uncertainty about his capacity to succeed his father as a leader. Leto admits to having had concerns of his own when he was younger and insists that Paul will succeed in achieving leadership in the same way that he did. Later that day, Paul and Gurney have a sparring session during which Gurney advises Paul to be more merciless in battle and more vigilant about the threat posed by the Harkonnens. In the evening while resting, Chani starts to appear in Paul's nightmares. Jessica wakes Paul and informs him that Reverend Mother, Gaius Helen Mohiam, Jessica's superior in the Ben Gesserit, has come to test him. Paul is examined by Souk Dr. Wellington Yue before the meeting, who informs him that the Ben Gesserit have their own goals. Mohiam subjects Paul to the Gom Jabar test, which involves a poison needle and a pain-inflicting box. Following the exam, Mohiam inquires about Paul's dreams and whether they occasionally come true. Mohiam then criticizes Jessica for having a son with Duke Leto instead of the daughters she was supposed to have. She claims that Jessica believed her son would be the Kaisatz Hadarach, the realization of a Bene Gesserit messianic prophecy. Jessica reaffirms this notion, and Mohiam cautions her that Paul's skills are still developing and that he could pass away during the upcoming trials. After Mohiam departs, Paul asks his mother what Mohiam really means. In order to create an exceptional intellect that can perceive both the past and the future, Jessica says that the Bene Gesserit have spent hundreds of years engaged in a selective breeding program. Next day, the Atreides have arrived on Arrakis. When they get off the ship, the natives start shouting something Paul doesn't understand. Paul's mother responds, It's a local prophecy of the Lisan al Gaib, the voice from the outer world, a prophesied messiah on Arrakis. Paul dismisses the idea that he might be this individual, which Jessica claims they believe to be Paul, as mere superstition promoted by the Bene Gesserit. After arriving at a palace, Shadout Mapes, a freeman servant, is hired by Jessica. Mapes perceives Jessica and Paul as the fulfillment of the Lisan al Gaib, and she gifts Jessica a knife forged from the teeth of Shai Hulud, the enormous sandworms that make Arrakis's desert so treacherous. While studying a holographic image that night of the Muad'Dib desert mouse, Paul avoids an assassination attempt by a hunter-seeker drone when Mapes gets into the room, diverting it. After the unsuccessful assassination of Paul, Leto takes a look around his new realm and sees that the Harkonnens have ruined most of the necessary infrastructure. They decide to take the matter to the Imperial Arbiter of the Changeover, Liet Kynes, an ecological who has lived on Arrakis for years. 
Duncan Idaho has returned from spending several weeks with the Freeman. He informs the Duke that the Freeman are unrivaled combatants who dwell in sitches in tunnels under the desert. Thufir Hawat's conviction that there are far more Freemen than originally thought is confirmed by Duncan. Stilgar, the leader of one of these sitches, has arrived to speak with Leto. Stilgar mandates that the Outworlders only leave the city to mine spices. Leto declines but swears that the Sitchis will be safe and that Freeman will not be persecuted as long as the Atreides are in power. Stilgar is invited to remain, but he declines. Duncan shows the Atreides various Freeman technologies, such as moisture-saving still suits and thumpers used for luring sandworms. To examine the spice mining activities, Leto's party meets with Leet Kynes. She examines their still suits, discovering that Paul has intuitively fitted his still suit in the Freeman style. He shall know your ways as though born to them, she adds in her home tongue. The group takes off on a plane to inspect a spice mining operation. The mining vehicle, known as a sand crawler, has lured a worm, which is pulled by the crawler's rhythmic vibrations as it gathers the spice. Duke Leto lands his tiny squad of ornithopters nearby to rescue the miners when a flying carryall fails to retrieve the mining truck. When Paul comes out to help the miners inside, he is hit with a tremendous amount of spice and has a series of visions, one of which is of himself with Chani. When Gurney grabs him and hauls him on board his father's ornithopter, he is nearly pulled down into the sand by the crawler. The two stand there watching as the worm's massive toothed jaw opens and consumes the sand crawler completely. Later, Dr. Yue examines Paul and advises him and his mother that the spice is psychotropic, but will not damage Paul. Later that night when everyone was sleeping, Duke Leto wakes up in the middle of the night with the feeling that something is awry. He tries to contact security, but receives no response. He discovers Mapes has been stabbed to death and gets struck with a paralytic dart that burrows through his body barrier and into his back leaving him helpless. Yue admits to being a traitor. He has deactivated the shields and hacked Atreides' comms. Yue tells Leto that the Harkonnens obtained his cooperation by holding his wife hostage. Then he implants one of Duke Leto's teeth with a poison capsule, hoping the Duke will use it to assassinate the Baron. As the Harkonnen soldiers, supported by Imperial Sardaukar elite force, launch their assault, Gurney awakens and leads the counterattack. The Atreides' forces are rapidly crushed after being taken off guard and outnumbered by Harkonnen troops and the Sardaukar. Duncan kills numerous Sardaukar and attempts to rescue Paul and Jessica, only to discover them gone. Baron Vladimir Harkonnen had assured Mohiam and the Bene Gesserit that he would not hurt Paul or Jessica, so he dispatched some of his soldiers to transport them to the desert, where they would perish from exposure. Paul, despite his lack of confidence in his Bene Gesserit talents, is able to use the voice to command one of the men to take off his mother's gag. Jessica instantly instructs one of the men to murder his fellow soldier. When she is finally liberated, she murders two of them. Their ornithopter is deactivated remotely and lands. From afar, Paul and Jessica see Arakeen's anguish. Meanwhile, at a meeting with Duke Vladimir Harkonnen, Yue asks that Baron Harkonnen uphold his half of the bargain. The Baron makes a guarantee that Yue will see his wife again before slitting his neck. Then, while Leto is paralyzed, the Baron gloats over him. Leto bites down on his false tooth and releases the poison, killing everyone in the room except the Baron, who was able to activate his body shield and utilize his anti-gravity suspensors to float to the roof. The Baron is given medical care by technicians to recover. Paul is experiencing visions from his exposure to spices while sheltering during a storm in a survival tent. They are at first about Chani. However, they soon transform into images of violent warfare and religious fanatics acting in Duke Leto's name and under the Atreides banner, spreading over the galaxy like an unquenchable fire. Paul is appalled by what he sees, accusing his mother and the Bene Gesserit, but ultimately finding solace from his mother. Duncan Idaho, who managed to escape the massacre, saves Paul and Jessica. Duncan takes them to Kynes, who has established up shop in a Freeman-occupied former terraforming facility. The Freeman attacked the Sarduker once they had tracked them there and killed many of them. Duncan makes a last-ditch effort to give himself up so that Paul, Jessica, and Kynes can escape. Jessica and Paul escape in an ornithopter. Kynes sets up a thumper with the intention of calling a sandworm and riding it away, but the Sarduker fatally wounds her. A sandworm shows up before they can deal the fatal blow, and Kynes draws it to her by hammering a patch of drum sand. The worm swallows them all. Paul gets a vision of a Freeman man giving him guidance while piloting the ornithopter during a violent sandstorm, telling him that survival in the desert is a process and that he must move with the flow of the environment. Paul retracts the thopter's wings, allowing the vortex of the storm to carry them deeper into the desert. 
They survive, but because the ornithopter is destroyed, they must go across the desert on foot. Freeman are watching them as they go. Jessica and Paul proceed to the location where they believe the Freeman's sitches are. Their motions attract a sandworm, and they flee to some closest rocks. The sandworm appears to glance at Paul for a few seconds before being drawn away by a thumper. After sandworm is gone, they are apprehended by a group of freemen. Stilgar joins them and recognizes Paul, telling them that they cannot touch him. Jameis, another freeman, rejects Stilgar's ideology and wishes to murder Paul and Jessica and take their body water. Jameis is recognized by Paul as the man from his dreams. Jessica requests assistance in returning to Caladan, stating that they will be highly rewarded, but Stilgar dismisses any payment as meaningless. Stilgar agrees to let Paul, who is still young, join their sitches, but Jessica, who he believes is too old to fight, must be left behind. Jessica and Paul use their Bene Gesserit training to disarm the majority of the freemen and threaten Stilgar with a knife. Stilgar relents when he realizes Jessica is a Bene Gesserit and decides to take both of them to the sitches. Jameis opposes, and Jessica is challenged to a duel. Paul agrees to campaign for his mother. Chani, who is among the party, feels sorry for Paul, whom she worries will die at the hands of Jameis, and gives him her Chris knife, a dagger crafted from a sandworm's teeth, a moment from one of Paul's dreams. Paul outclasses Jameis in the duel, repeatedly holding a knife to his throat and demanding that he yield. Stilgar warns him that Freeman duels are death matches, and Jessica claims that Paul has never murdered anyone. Paul murders Jameis regretfully. After the fight is over, the Freeman return Paul and Jessica to their sitches. In the last scene of the movie, Paul and Jessica witness a Freeman riding a live worm. Chani faces Paul as they begin their journey into the desert and tells him that this is only the beginning. With its epic storytelling, stellar cast, and stunning visuals, Dune left a lasting impression. Share your thoughts on what's next for Arrakis and hit that subscribe button for updates on Dune Part 2. Until then, may the spice flow, and we'll see you in the desert.